5110 silicone casting basics. In this tutorial, we're going to cover the basic process of casting 5110 silicone and how to color it and properly mix it, and of course, how to cast it. And for this, we're gonna actually be casting this into a mold we made in a previous tutorial that is made of a sister product to this, 5140. So we're going to be pouring this into a 5140 firm silicone mold. And that requires some very important steps to make sure this all works and we don't wind up making a little face-shaped paperweight. Now 5110 is on the softer end of the spectrum that is designed to simulate human skin, fairly firm human skin like the tips of your fingers. So 5110 of course is a one to one mix ratio and it's fairly soft, it measures around a 10 on the shore A scale. And it has a really low viscosity. This is what will interest a lot of you casting dolls and masks and that sort of thing. This has a 2500 centipoise mixed viscosity. A 30 minute working time, so really 30 to 40 minute working time depending on your room temperature. And of course a 3 to 4 hour demold. And the reason for that difference in that 3 to 4 hours is the ambient temperature. You want to be around 70 to 75 degrees anytime you're working with a platinum silicone. Because uh, the warmer, obviously, that, that it is in the work environment, the faster it will cure. And of course, last but not least, this can be thickened with Thixo. And that's really important for patching air bubbles and that sort of thing. Now, the first step we need to do anytime we're measuring out uh, skin colored silicone, obviously you've seen pr plenty of our tutorials where we pigment this to look like human skin, but one of the tricks if you're building it up in layers or uh, you know, working on any kind of large project where you're going to be working in multiple batches, it's really good practice to go ahead and dispense some silicone into a couple of uh, mixing cups. Here we're labeling these ahead of time so we don't get them confused, a 5110 part A and 5110 part B and then measuring out the silicone we're going to use for that project into the appropriate mixing cups. Now the reason for this is we're going to pigment these independent of each other and that way we get one uniform color with every batch that we mix up. Now if you're using the same silicone pigment obviously that's not that difficult to match but because we're going to be adding flocking colors to this it's really important to make sure that all those batches match up and again and especially if for some reason we were to run out of silicone and have to mix up a smaller batch, we want to make sure all of that matches. Now once we've got the uh, A and B measured out, we're going to add some white silicone pigment. Now the reason for this, again, if you've seen our previous videos, you know the drill. If we're matching fairly uh, fair flesh tones, like in this case, I'm uh, matching the face of my daughter Raya, who has a very fair complexion. So we're going to use uh, just a couple of grams of silicone pigment in both of those buckets. And then we're going to add flocking to that. And one of the things I'm doing here is I'm trying to very carefully add the same amount of flocking to both. Now obviously we don't have to be accurate to the individual fiber, but you want to be as precise as possible. And I'll show an overhead view here so you can get a little better idea of what I'm doing. But we want to make sure we have a similar little pile of flocking forming in both buckets. And the colors I'm using here, again, this is typically for when I'm matching uh, fair flesh tones, is I'm using our flesh tone flocking, then a little bit of the yellow and a little bit of tan, and of course some of the red. And I'm going to go back and add a little bit more here in a minute, but this is a good jumping off point for a fair flesh tone. And the reason why I'm going to mix this up fairly fairly fair and light is you always want to match the lightest flesh tone in the color scheme because with silicone when you're painting with uh, translucent paints and over a translucent material to preserve that realism and get everything as accurate and realistic as possible you want to be moving darker not lighter because if you start with something too dark and you have to lighten it up that means you're going to have to add uh, opaque colors to that and that will really keep kill that translucency and ultimately the realism. So again, always better to err on the side of being a little lighter than the skin tone than darker. 
Now, once we get that all mixed up, again, this is the time where you, you have plenty of time at this point since you don't have A and B mixed together. You have all the time in the world to adjust this as you need to get the flesh tone and dialed in just right to the color you want. So here I decided to add a little bit more of that flesh tone flocking and uh, a little bit more of that uh, kind of capillary red color. But again, real important here, obviously whatever you're doing to one, you do to the other. And again, doesn't have to be uh, you know super exact down to the individual fiber, but be as careful and precise as possible. And a little bit of uh, the yellow flocking just to be on the safe side. And this is one of those things that the more of this you do, the better you'll get at it. This is why I recommend to a lot of you starting out that uh, one of the best things you can do is start with a little simple silicone part like a face or a hand or something like that just to play around with the materials and get a feel for how to color them accurately and of course uh, trim and paint and seam those accordingly. So again, we're getting that all mixed up. And one thing you want to be very careful about, because flocking, um, even though flocking is very low density and will mix in just fine, over time, the flocking will actually settle out. So you want to be careful about that, because if you let this sit for a long period of time, the flocking will start to separate, and then, of course, your color is going to be totally different than what you intend. So make sure you mix those up right before you're ready to dispense your material. Now, this is a step that I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. We're going to be using a 5140 platinum silicone mold. And this is a mold I made in a previous tutorial. I'll link it in the end screen. But real important, this is a non-silicone mold release. It does not contain any silicone oil. And that is crucial. If it contains any silicone oil, that will result in the silicone either inhibiting or trying to bond to the mold surface. So real important there. Now, the other super uber important step is you'll notice I'm spraying it in and brushing it into the detail. And that's a critical step here to make sure that the release gets into all the little nooks and crannies, little wrinkles and skin and things like that. If we don't do that step, we can wind up with the release sitting on the high points, but not in uh, some of those little deeper recessed areas which would result in the silicone tearing at those points if it tries to bond to the silicone, like around the eyes uh, and uh, especially around the nose and the lips and things like that. Any place where there's a little crease that doesn't get released, that's where the silicone wants to bond. And you'll also find that this works best with uh, silicone molds that have cured a while for a day or two. But do not skimp on release. Now calculating weight, one of the nice things is since we molded this pattern to make the original mold, we have that sitting around and I can check the weight of that original resin pattern. So I'm going to add about 5% to that and that's uh, because the silicone is a little denser than the resin we cast. So that's a good jumping off point. Now. I typically add, if once I know roughly how much silicone it's going to take to make a part, in this case I'm mixing up about 600 grams, I always like to mix up more than I actually need because there's always going to be some little thing that might, some little hiccup in the casting process where you want to make sure you've got a little bit extra for safety. And you never want to mix up exactly what the mold takes because that would, of course, require you to get every last little drop out of the mixing bucket, and that is not going to happen. So make sure you always mix a little bit more than you need. It just about 5% is a good uh, starting point for that. And now we need to mix thoroughly both parts together. And remember that with a 30 minute working time, there's no excuse for bad mixing. Use a clean stir stick to scrape the sides and a, the bottom of the mixing bucket several times and get that all mixed together. Now, a quick word about the mold. Remember, we sprayed that heavily with mold release. You want to make sure that you give that plenty of time to outgas before you pour your silicone. So this mold sat for a good 30 minutes before we did this pour. And you'll notice that I'm pouring into the deepest part, the nose, and just allowing the silicone to seek its level. And the more astute viewers will notice that I did not vacuum degas the silicone. This is a very low viscosity formula, so I'm going to show you how this comes out without degassing. So I'm going to pour up a little sample in a Dixie cup, and we're going to cut that open later, just so we can see what that looks like with no uh, vacuum degassing done.
Now I was kind of impatient, so I went ahead and demolded this in about three hours. Um, it is winter time here, so it's uh, that's slowing things down a little bit. But at three hours in a relatively warm shop, it at least had the strength where I could very carefully peel that out of the mold. But real important there, that is why good release is imperative. Make sure you release your mold properly so you can get that out. And also make sure that you're using a mold release that you know how to remove later on. We'll uh, have a painting tutorial posted soon, but that is a, a really important thing to remember that whatever mold release you use needs to be able to be removed. Now, I actually poured a couple of layers of silicone into this cup from a couple of other things I was pouring. And one of the things I wanted to show is how that sticks together, those two layers that were poured several hours apart, and they got an incredible bond. So just showing how silicone, that 5110, bonds very well to itself, provided it's poured fresh on top of the previous pour. If you wait too long, then you don't get as nice of a bond there. And now we're going to cut that open, and now you can see we have a nice bubble-free part. Now, if we were to get out a microscope, I'm sure we could find some little micro bubbles in there. But this will show you how a lot of applications with fairly straightforward, simple pores will not require vacuum degassing. Now, if you are using this as a mold material and you're going to be pressure casting, then, of course, vacuum degassing is imperative. But just wanted to show some of you what you can get away with if you don't have the capability to vacuum degas the material. Now, stay tuned because we'll come back to this piece in another video and cover some painting techniques. But for now, remember that 5110 silicone and, of course, the additives and mold release are all available on our web store at brickintheyard.com. And, of course, I'll put links in the video description and uh, be sure to check those out. And those of you who are looking for some of our previous video material, a lot of that is available now exclusively on our video library. So I'll put a link to that as well in the video description. So again, remember to visit us at brickintheyard.com. And if you want to stay up on all the new things happening at Biddy Mold Supply, be sure to sign up for our newsletter. And as always, be sure to like, and if you haven't already, subscribe and click that little bell icon so you get notified when we put out new content. And thanks again for watching.